somebody that's close by, not too close, give them an air high five. Good to see you. <laughs> Amen. So as we worship the Lord today, as we just give him praise and give him thanks for the things that he has done, already done, but how many of you know that he is just beginning to do what he does in the realm of awesomeness? <laughs> Amen. Uh, okay, if you're happy to be here, 
smile at somebody so you're, you at least, at least let them know that your face is happy. <laughs> takes things that the enemy meant for evil, and he works all things together for good. And 
those, those areas of our life that seem to be in shambles and have been shattered under, under that attack or because the situation and circumstances seem so far out of your control that you don't know what's going to happen. He still is the one that puts it back together. Amen. I, I like this song, Graves into Gardens.
So every, every situation, every circumstance ah, is just a provision for God to do a miracle and to give you a testimony. Do you know that he loves you? I said, do you know that he loves you? Behind you and beside you 
mercy and his graces. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Tell somebody that's very close. He is for you. Strength. How many need some strength? How many need more strength? Let me ask you a question. What do you think is going to happen next? Does anybody know what's going to happen next? <laughs> in, the, in the chain of things and in in everything that has taken place so far, um, it's, hard, it's hard to know. Nobody knows except the Father in heaven. And I want to give you the encouragement this morning from his word, not only to know that whatever we are going to go through, whether this coronavirus all of a sudden evaporates and is gone like, uh, like SARS did, or whether it continues, or whether this dissipates and something else shows up. It, you know, we were, we were thinking that uh, what else could happen? And then the murder hornets showed up, right? What else could happen in the, some of the greatest fires that have ever taken place on the planet there in Australia? What else? Um, I, I want you to be encouraged because fear, someone said fear, fear would try to grip you and manipulate you and to cause you just to go into hiding. Cause you just to re, be a recluse and say, I'm just going to wait it out. And there's some people that are just going to try to wait it out. But I, I want you to know that there's a provision for you right now in the midst of what you're going through. God has strength for you. And um, David, he, as he is now just coming to King David, if you, if you read there, and we're going to First Chronicles, he is... Ascending to the throne, finally, after years of going through highs and a whole lot of lows, he finally is coming into the kingdom. He's com coming into that provision that God had promised him. And, uh, and, and during this time, he's in the Hebron, and there is many people are coming to him. Many of the armies are now coming to his aid, coming to his side as he is now moving towards the coronation of being king. And that's where this, is, this story is picked up in First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 23. I want you to look at this. It says, now these were the numbers of the divisions that were equipped for war. I want you to, I want you to note that these were equipped for war. Each one of these that he's going to list, these are, these are those that had, that had come that were already not only warriors, but they, they came equipped for war and came to David in the Hebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. Of the sons of Judah, bearing a shield and spear, 6,800 armed for war. The sons of Simeon, mighty men of valor, fit for war, 7,100. Of the sons of Levi, 4,600. Jehoda, the leader of the Aaronites, and with them 3,700. Zadok, a young man, a valiant warrior, and from his father's house, 22 captains. Of the sons of Benjamin, relatives of Saul, 3,000. Until the greatest part of them had remained loyal to the house of Saul. And of the sons of Ephraim. 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous men throughout the father's house. Of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000 who were designated by the name to come and make David king. Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, their chiefs were 200, and their brethren were at their command. Of Zebulun, there were 50,000 who went out to battle, expert in war, and all the weapons of war, stout-hearted men who could keep ranks. And it goes on. There's like 3,000 here, 4,000, 5,000, 18,000, 20,000, 50,000, and they're all assembling. And the, and the one thing that I noted out of these that are coming from the tribes of Israel that are gathering to David king as he is 
ascending the throne as he is going to be coronated as king there in the Hebron. That's where he's at. That's where he had gathered and he had made his, his home there. But now he's going to be king and he's going to go back to Jerusalem, the city of David, and to establish the temple there. And this is what David, and, and you're reading all these guys that are showing up. But, but there's one little note I want you to, why don't you go back to 32? Because there's, there's something there that's very interesting to me. And I, I caught this. And I don't know what's going on. Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times. I want you to note that. At understanding of the times. This was an anointing. This was a provision. God-given understanding of what's going on, of the times, of the seasons. And, look at this, to know what Israel ought to do. How many were there? Just 200. We just got done listing 8,000, 5,000, 15,000, 20,000, 50,000. But Issachar shows up with 200. But I'm willing to tell you that these 200 from Issachar were the most important out of all who came. For all who came were ready for war, mighty in valor, but 200. It didn't list that they came with weapons. It didn't list that they came as warriors. They came as those that was able to discern and understand the season. And then know what to do. We need this anointing to understand what's going on. This is not just a pandemic. There are more areas and there are more idiosyncrasies that are coming along with this economic is, is going to be lasting in our nation, in the world. Th this is just, listen to me, this is just one little area. I believe we're living in the end days. And whether this is to continue or whether it's to lift. And I got done asking you just as we started. And I said, what's next? And, and nobody knows. There's only one that knows. Come on, there's only one that really knows what's going to happen. And this is all part of the times of the season that we're living in. The end days. You're breathing in times air. This is what Jesus had prophesied, Matthew chapter 24, that these things are going to happen and take place. We need to be able to discern the season and to know exactly what's happening around us. Not to cower in fear, not to shrink back, but to know what to do. To know exactly what he'd have us to do. To move in the authority of the gospel. To move under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. To be the light, the brightest light in the darkest night. To be able to minister to those that are hurting. I, I promise you, the economic disaster that is taking place, there are going to be a lot of folks that are hurting, and they need to know about Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Those that have been overwhelmed with sickness, they need to know Jehovah Rapha, our healer. You have the light. You have the provision. We need to know what we're to do in the season that we're in. And that comes from the provision. It comes from the strength. Someone say strength. So to be able to understand these things, yes, we need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We need the direction of our Lord and Savior. But more than that, we also need the strength and the provision to do what he's called us to do. Because it's so easy to get overwhelmed. You listen to the news. You go on social media. It doesn't take long. And you can be overwhelmed with fear about all that's taking place on every level. And if you really have, have removed yourself from those things, praise the Lord. You don't really need to know all that's going on. All the naysayers and all the, the could be and the would be, it should be. But what we need to know is the times and the season according to what the Father is giving to us. So that when we listen to the Holy Spirit, say this is where we're at. This is what we need to do. That we can do what he's calling us to do. Without fear and intimidation. 
Hmm. That was your opportunity for more than two people to say amen. <laughs> I know you haven't been in church for a while. It's going to take a while to get you back on track. Amen. That's going to be good. And, and I know you're taking this in. But where we got to go this morning is, is deep water. Okay? It's, it's in this place that oftentimes, if you're used to the kiddie pool, put on the water wings. Put on the swimmies. Grab the pool noodle. We're going deep. Amen. <laughs> this, is, this is the strength and the provision. You need the strength and the provision. A lot of people will say, well, you know, I'm waiting for that. I'm waiting for God to show up because I need his help. I need his help. Um, we are going through probably what the, I would consider the perfect storm. There are so many things that have lined up and God orchestrated. He allowed, someone say, allow Satan is behind this sickness and disease, but God allowed it. Nothing happens without the approval, without the okay of the Father. Satan just can't come and go as he pleases. Do you know the Word of God? And so he allowed it, and then he works through it. He allowed that, I believe, to prepare this world for revival. To prepare hearts and lives of people to realize there is a whole lot more than, than going through life, going from paycheck to paycheck, or trying to build my kingdom. And he's preparing, he removes things or puts people in difficult situations so they have to move beyond themselves. To be able to connect with an awesome God. You're going to need God's help, God's strength, God's provision, God's wisdom, his knowledge to know what to do in the season that we're in. We see in Isaiah 40, 31, and this is a portion of Scripture that many, many of you know, and we have quoted often, said, they that wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. Say renew. They'll renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. And so we look at this portion of Scripture about renewed strength, and renewed strength is important, but we need something besides just a renewing of something that we had. We need something more. We need, a, in addition to what we had, we need fresh anointing. We need a fresh provision. We need a greater strength. You see, a renewed strength and it is an increased provision. It's an increased provision. Those things are, those are two different things. He renews what I had or he gives me something more. God's provision, his power, his purpose is released in the storm. God's power, his purpose, his provision, all those things that he has is released and given to you in the storm. Not before the storm, not after the storm, in the midst of the storm. I touched a little bit of this on Wednesday night in Mark chapter 4. I'm going to reiterate for those of you that were going to be here on our Wednesday night Bible study because we're, we're beginning our Wednesday night ministries as well in, in accordance to the numbers that we can have that is given to us in, in ministries throughout the week. Um, we have Tuesday prayer meeting, Tuesday night, as well as Wednesday Bible study. And then we have in, encounter groups. There's a number of encounter groups that you can connect with on Thursday night. So be aware of that. Get, get plugged in. Get plugged in and you'll be encouraged. Mark chapter 4 verse 35 if you have your Bible and you <clears throat> know where to turn to. If not, there's right there. On the same day when the evening had come, he said, and let's cross over to the other side. Let's cross over to the other side. Let's go over to the other side. They're on one side of the Galilee. They're going to cross over to the other side of the Galilee because there's ministry that needs to be engaged on the other side of the lake. There's people that their lives needs to be changed. So let's get in the boat. Let's head on over. Are you with me? God's directing us to know what to do. He said, we're going to go across. And this is important. You need to make a note of this. Cross over. Let's go to the other side. Underline that in your Bible, if you would. Highlight that a little bit. We need to go to the other side. So in future times, when you read this portion of Scripture, God will bring back to your memory the things that you need to remember. And that is to focus that God gives you direction. He's going to fulfill the purpose that he's given to you. He's not going to delay it. It'll come to pass. He will give you the help and the strength to cross over. 
Now when they had left the multitudes, he took with him the boat that he was, and all the other little boats also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so it was filling up. Waves coming into the boat, boat filling up with water. What happens? The boat sinks. Pretty easy to figure that one out. Now, you have in the boat three fishermen. Three fishermen. This is not the first time the disciples been in a boat together. You have three fishermen beforehand, previous times, because these were mariners. These guys knew that body of water. They grew up on that body of water. They'd fished that portion of the ocean. They had been in storms before. And so when the rest of the disciples see the three fishermen panicking and upset, then that is a cause for everybody to literally go out of your mind. We are going to die. And that went through their spirit. In fact, if you read it, they wake up Christ and they say, because he's asleep in the stern on a pillow and he's sleeping. This is the first waterbed ever listed in the Bible. He's asleep on the waterbed because he's tired. And they wake him up. No, he's not upset that they wake him up. They're not upset that they come to him. They're not, Jesus is not, is, is not put out because they are asking and look, looking to him. Why he got upset with them, and he said, why are you so afraid? Why are you so full of little faith? Why you have little faith? Why don't you have more faith? And, and he's, he's upset with them for this one reason, I believe, is because the question they asked, do you not care that we're going to die. Do not ever let the enemy put within your heart or your mind that Jesus doesn't care. Oh, he cares for you. I said, he cares for you much more than you could ever know. He took your place. He took my sin, your sin, and he nailed it to the cross. He laid down his life because he cares. There's nothing more that he could have done. Now, he's making an intercession for you. He's released the presence of his Holy Spirit to minister to you, to overwhelm, to guide and direct you, to walk with you, to carry you, to minister to you, empower you. Jesus cares. I said, Jesus cares for you more than you'll ever know. One thing that we learn through this portion of Scripture that I've seen, Holy Spirit drew out, is you are defined by the gifts and anointings. That's your definition. The world doesn't define you. You're not defined by vocation or location, pedigree, friends. You are defined by who God says you are. You are defined by your gifts and anointings. It's the storm. Look at this. It's the storm that reveals your purpose. The storm will bring out those gifts and anointings. The storm will allow others to see who you really are. The storm in the difficult times is when you shine the brightest. Not to cower in weakness, but to rise up in the authority and the provision and the grace of the Almighty God to do what He's called you to do. It is the storm that reveals your purpose. Uh, and here, let, me, let me show you this. So you, Some of you are looking, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure what you're saying. You know Daniel, right? Daniel in the Old Testament. We go to Sunday school and we learn about Daniel because of what? It was just a, another guy until it was the lion's den. Daniel in the lion's den. If it had not been for the lion's den, you probably wouldn't remember Daniel. How about the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It was because what? The fiery furnace. If it had not been for the fiery furnace, all you'd know them as the first vegetarians in the Bible, which really is not that significant. But it was the fiery furnace that made the difference. David, it's just a little David. It, it, he was anointed king, 15 year old boy, the ruddy cheeks, the Bible says. And he really wasn't all that special until he met with what? 
the giant. Then people say, whoa, that's the king. You had to go through difficulties, went through hardship. Think about Joseph. If it had not been for Joseph being sold into slavery, ending up in prison, and then through that difficult time of prison and, and being in slavery, ascending to the second only to Pharaoh to save the whole nation of Israel, all you would have known him as is the first, the, 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 the first stylish guy that had a coat of many colors. And that's not that significant. If it had not been knowing that Ruth, who was in the lineage of Christ, someone that had lost her husband, living in a drought, being faithful to her mother-in-law, even when her mother-in-law said, you can go, Oprah left, you can go, you can leave. He just said, no, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And she said that in the most difficult moment of her life. That's why we remember Ruth. And that's why God raised her up. You know, the Apostle Paul that ministers to us on, usually on a daily basis through the word, the, 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 his letters that he wrote to the churches of Philippians, Galatians, well, Colossians, Corinthians, Romans. You, you ever remember any of those? Is any of those ringing a bell, anybody? Guess where they were written? From prison. From prison. They're called the prison epistles. The blessing that we have received today from our dear brother Paul is because he was going through the roughest time, one of the roughest times of his life. And it wasn't after he finished those, he went to be with the Lord. I'm telling you, in the most difficult area, the greatest storm of your life, that's when the power of God shows up in the greatest provision that you'll ever know. Your entire anointings and giftings are made for the storm. Amen. You know, you'll never need his help in the midst of the storm as long as you stay on the shore. If I stay on the shore, I won't sink in that boat. Right? That's one of those duh statements, right? However, if you stay on the shore, you'll never go anywhere. You'll never fulfill your purpose. What do he say? We're going to the other side. It's on the other side that ministry was going to take place and the storm was used to build faith. To build a deeper level of trust so that they would understand no matter what happens, as long as we're with Jesus, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. If God would have shown you the fierceness of the storm beforehand, we would have run the other direction as fast as we could. We'd have been like Jonah heading towards Tarsus. I'm out of here. 
That's the reason why oftentimes he does not show you ahead of time what's going to happen. He doesn't want you to be overwhelmed with fear. He doesn't want you to anticipate anything that's going to be difficult. He'll just guide you and direct you and you wake up in the midst of whether it's a pandemic or a personal storm, whether it's a financial issue or a physical issue, a relationship issue that you've got going on in your life. That storm is taking place. God is in the storm. He's with you in the storm. And those gifts and anointings that he's given to you are manifesting right now. Come on, manifesting right now through your life. It's not time for the church to cower back in the darkness and try to wait this out so we can be business as usual. No, it's time for the church to rise up with the anointings and the giftings that God has given to us to fulfill our purpose in the midst of this pandemic and be the light he's called us to be. That's worth an amen. Roman, or Isaiah, was, look at this, last portion of scripture, Isaiah 43, Isaiah 43, would you turn there? If you have yet to underline this or highlight this in your Bible, it's an excellent, exciting opportunity for you to just be encouraged today by God's word. If you have received nothing up till now, I want you to grab a hold of this, hang on to this, promises as we go out today. Isaiah 43, verse 1. Isaiah 43, verse 1. He said, But now, said the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he formed you, O Israel, fear not. I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. You belong to Jesus. He purchased you. He bought you with his own blood. He sets you apart. He's, he's blessed you coming in, blessed you going out. You belong to Jesus. That, that should put something within your being that the enemy cannot shatter. He cannot, he cannot cause it to be dissipated or removed. You know this morning that you are his. He is yours. He said, you are mine and I am yours. You belong to the one that created the universe. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. He is for you. You are mine. And before he said that, he said, fear not. I want you to say something with me this morning. I want you to speak to that fear that the enemy would throw at you. Say, not. Not today, devil. Not tomorrow, Satan. Not ever again. I'm not going to fear. Fear is not going to grip me. Fear is not going to manipulate me. Fear in the, oh, it's the what if. Satan will say, this is going to happen or that's going to happen. He'll put a thousand things in your heart and your mind about how things are going to fall apart or how things are going to unravel. And it's not. Fear is not going to take a hold of me. Fear is not going to manipulate my mind, my heart. Fear is not going to find a place within me. I will not fear. Fear not. <laughs> Amen. Shut up, devil. When you pass through the waters, is that what it says in your Bible? As it says up there, when, when. You didn't you notice something it didn't say? He didn't say, if you pass, or you might pass through the waters, going in through the storm and stuff's coming over the bow and people are freaking out. And, and he didn't say, oh, oh when, when somebody else, that happens to somebody else, you can encourage them. And I said, when you point to somebody and say, you just in case you're not sure what it's saying what it's talking about when you pass through the waters now if that's all you heard it'd be kind of overwhelming that's like a that's like a foreshadowing of bad things to come but no he's saying when you pass i will be with you i'm with you through the river they'll not overflow you when you walk 
when you walk through the fire. How many of you have been tested by some fire recently? You've gone through some fire. There's some things that have not been feeling good, has not been well. And you're thinking, God, how can you be in this? How can you, how can you do this? How can you behind, be behind something that has caused so much devastation? When you walk through the fire, you, you, you shall not be burned, nor the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba in your place. What he's saying here, along the lines of Egypt and Ethiopia. Egypt, at this particular time, when Isaiah is alive, Egypt is one of the greatest powers on the planet, military might on the planet, this particular time. And he said, this is what I'm, I will, I will give them all the power and all the might for you, for ransom for you. Ethiopia was the richest nation along a trade route, one of the richest nations on the planet this time. He said, I will trade them all the riches and the wealth of Ethiopia for you because you are more important to me than the power of this world or the wealth of this world. Isn't that awesome? I'm with you. He's saying that to reiterate one very specific thing. I not only love you, but I care for you. These things are taking place. You're in the world, and they're going to be painful times. There are going to be situations, circumstances beyond our control. You're going to be overwhelmed. Let it be settled in your spirit. He's with me. These things that are happening, that he's allowed to take place. I need one very specific thing. I need that anointing of Issachar. I need to discern the time we're living in, in days. I need to discern it. I need to remind myself this. And the second part of that anointing is to know what to do. I need to know what God would have me to do. Not to be manipulated by fear or anxiety. Not to stand in a, in a place of wonder or, or belittlement because I feel so helpless or inadequate. But I need to rise up with the anointings and the giftings in the midst of this storm and do what he's called me to do. To have some discernment. I will promise you there are thousands of people in our city who are still gripped with fear anxiety and not knowing what's going to happen not knowing what's going to take place you have been ministering to many people they have been watching your life many of them need just a reassurance if you hang on to Jesus he'll carry you through this what an opportunity we have to shine a light in dark places To be what he's called us to be. Your gifts, your anointings are going to manifest in this storm. Would you stand? Our prayer is Lord, not only give us this anointing to understand the times, to know what you want us to do. Not only give us that anointing, but lead us by your spirit so we can walk in the fullness of our defining moment. This is your defining moment. Church, 
Just like the lion's den for Daniel. Just like the fiery furnace for the three Hebrew children. Just like the prison that defined the ministry and the power and the authority of the apostle Paul as he spoke life into us today. This is your defining moment. May those gifts and anointings rest upon you in a greater provision, even today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your grace and your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your word, and you are with us now. And you have given to us the strength. You have given to us a, a greater appreciation for you. You have drawn us closer than we've been before. Lord, you have shown us and you have led us into areas, into arenas that oh, we've been longing for to see you move and see the power and the might of an of a awesome God. But Lord, there are so many that need your help. I'm asking that you would just begin to remove fear, remove anxiety, remove the, the helplessness from your people and cause them now just to be uh, overwhelmed by your presence, undergirded by your spirit, and that all that you're doing for them ministers through them. Lives are going to be touched this week. Hearts are going to be drawn because these your people not only understand and discern the moment and the time that they're in, but Lord, they're going to receive direction to what to do how to do it. Guide them by that same provision, that same grace. Anoint these one more time. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If the Lord spoke to you, just give him praise. Will you do that? Amen. amen.